Sometimes certain situations in life have you wishing for a quick way out. Waiting to have a meeting with your boss, heading into an important test, or getting ready to have an awkward conversation with a romantic partner who just texted that, we need to talk. All of these can be pretty hard to deal with. In times like these, it can be easy to want to run away. We feel a part of ourselves saying that it would just be better to just bail out as quickly as we can. But just because choosing to make an exit is often the quickest way to avoid a problem, that doesn't always mean it's the best solution. Especially when your means of escape venture into the world of the anomalous. Sometimes you have to face things head on. But if you are still really in need of a quick way out, then SCP-120 might just be what you're looking for. But don't say we didn't warn you. Now, hear us out. Yes, we know that it's a children's paddling pool. You might have even owned one yourself back in the day. When the warm summer months came rolling around, your younger self would have begged your poor parents to spend several minutes in the sun's glaring heat, breathlessly inflating a pool just like it, then filling it with water from the garden hose. All so that you could put on your water wings, have a splash around for an hour or two, then go inside to dry off. The result? Leaving the water in that paddling pool to go stagnant as it got left outside in the summer sun, filled with dirt, leaves, and mosquito larvae while you decided that air conditioning in Super Mario was a better way to spend your time. But SCP-120, as will likely come as no surprise, is no ordinary children's paddling pool. Sure, it might look like an ordinary paddling pool at first, pastel pink in color, only two and a half meters in diameter, and less than a meter tall. It's even made out of that same typical flimsy plastic that needs to be inflated with air to hold its shape. You know, the kind that absorbed all the heat from the sunlight while your younger self was out there splashing around, just waiting to burn your skin at the slightest touch. But the first key difference between SCP-120 and the pool you had while you were growing up is, well, this one is indestructible. Despite being made from common earth plastics, SCP-120 cannot be damaged or destroyed by any conventional means. Though the material it is made from will still flex when pressure is applied and is soft to the touch, it also possesses an anomalous tensile strength. In other words, SCP-120 cannot be ripped, stretched, or otherwise destroyed like an ordinary paddling pool can. And the SCP Foundation would know. They've destroyed their own fair share of paddling pools in the research labs. Okay, so SCP-120 is an indestructible child's paddling pool. Surely there has to be more to it than that. Otherwise, why would it be such an important object to the SCP Foundation? Well, you're right. There's much more to it than that. After all, they don't call it the teleporting paddling pool for nothing. Within the pool itself is a glowing substance, almost like a liquid, but somehow unlike any in existence, at least in this dimension. What exactly do we mean by that? Well, this liquid doesn't behave in quite the same way you would expect from, say, water, for example. And its physical properties don't align with the rules of our universe. Let's say you fill your ordinary paddling pool with water, just like you would have done on a hot summer day as a kid. Now, because of the properties of the water, you know you could easily grab a drinking glass from your kitchen cabinet and fill it up from the pool no problem. However, the substance within SCP-120 does not obey these same rules. You simply cannot grab a glass or other container and scoop up some of this glowing liquid. See what we mean? The liquid is only really a liquid in name and can't be manipulated in the same way that an ordinary liquid can. However, it does share the appearance of being a liquid, with its surface rippling and shimmering often as it moves. So put all that together and what is the conclusion you get? That this substance definitely does not exist in our own dimension. Instead, it is from somewhere else entirely. By far the biggest difference between SCP-120 and any ordinary pastel pink colored Walmart paddling pool is the property that the Foundation is most interested in. In fact, this paddling pool is part of the oh-so-rare category of SCPs that actually have a practical use, thanks to this anomalous property. Human beings, along with the clothes that they're wearing and any items they may be carrying, will be teleported to one of 11 different locations should they fall into the paddling pool. To reiterate, they don't call it the teleporting paddling pool for nothing. There are some small limitations to SCP-120's teleportation ability. For one, the weight of the objects or loads being carried through it by one person cannot exceed the maximum threshold of just under 38 kilos, or almost 84 pounds. 
There are also only 11 destinations that SCP-120 can send someone to, and these can't be pre-programmed or predetermined beforehand. Any subject stepping into the pool must be conscious, carrying weight under the specified amount, be biologically a human being, and can only use the teleporting paddle pool one person at a time. Meeting these requirements means that the pool will work as expected. The only repercussion of not meeting the aforementioned criteria is simply that the pool will not function. Any who have stepped into the pool carrying too much weight, for example, have merely reported that their feet touched the surface beneath the glowing liquid. First encountered by the SCP Foundation in September of 1992, SCP-120 was found in California following reports of children going missing in the area. There, they discovered the teleporting paddling pool and brought it back to Site-19 for testing. It is currently unknown how many children went missing, or if they were ever recovered. Regardless, remember how we talked about making a quick exit at the start of this video? Well, that's because the Foundation's biggest interest in SCP-120 was to use it as a means of rapid evacuation for their most important group of people, the Overwatch Command, also known as the O5 Council. During a major emergency like a containment breach, the O5s would use the paddling pool to escape to safety. As you may have gathered from how we've described it, SCP-120 has the inert ability to instantly relocate a person from one place to another. According to the theories of the SCP Foundation's researchers, it likely does this by allowing the subject to pass through one or more dimensions alternate to our own. We've also mentioned that one of the limits of SCP-120 is that it can only send someone to one of 11 different places. These are distinguished by the liquid-like substance contained in SCP-120 undergoing a change of color. By sending disposable members of D-Class personnel carrying radio beacons through, the Foundation has been able to compile a list of these destinations, and they are as follows. The first of these is the Pacific Ocean, denoted by a blue glow of SCP-120's liquid. When traveling here, subjects are deposited about 2 meters above the surface of the Pacific. Since this location was discovered during testing, a Foundation vessel named the SCPS Demeter has been stationed at these coordinates. To the public, this ship is known instead as the USS Nassau, operating under the cover story of being a simple meteorological boat. But why would the Foundation leave a boat here? The current position of this ship means that anyone traveling to the Pacific through the teleporting paddling pool will appear in the vessel's cargo hold. In a crisis, important personnel could be sent to the Demeter, and the boat could even be used to hold less dangerous SCP objects if they could be sent through SCP-120. Of course, teleporting oneself aboard a boat might be a bit trickier, say, during a storm. If the Demeter is moved too far from its current position, there's a chance someone might end up teleporting inside one of the ship's walls. The next location is Greenland, where SCP-120 will send someone when its liquid glows white. Arriving here, one will find themselves in a facility that the Foundation has established on site. The cover story for this one is that this building is part of an expansion of the oil industry. What members of the public are not privy to is the true function of the facility. The Foundation set up this site specifically to perform the same function as their ship, the Demeter. The facility even has an airstrip and a refueling station there, meaning any who use the paddling pool to teleport to Greenland can further relocate themselves aboard a Foundation aircraft if necessary. If the liquid in SCP-120 ever changes to become a deep black in color, it will then lead to one of five possible points that are all practically identical. These destinations are various Earth-Moon Lagrange points. In celestial mechanics, a Lagrange point is the area near two large bodies orbiting in space. To put it in simple terms, in this case, these are points between the Earth and the Moon where the gravitational forces of both balance each other out. This is what makes these Lagrange points such a good location for satellites, as the equal forces make it easier for a satellite to achieve the right path of orbit. So objects or people sent through SCP-120 when the water blackens will end up at either Lagrange point 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. These points are located all the way around the Earth and are directly between the Earth and the Moon whenever the latter makes its orbit around the former essentially jumping through the teleporting paddling pool when it has been dialed to one of these locations is like taking a high dive into the cold endless vacuum of space ending up lost forever impossible to retrieve the scp foundation plans to potentially use these scp-120 destinations to dispose of anomalous objects during a crisis as a way to prevent them from falling into the wrong hands 
Now we mentioned that SCP-120's liquid will glow white when it's linked to the destination in Greenland, but the same also occurs when it's dialed to the snow-capped mountains of the Himalayas. This famous mountain range in southern and eastern Asia is home to a number of planet Earth's tallest peaks, most notably Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world, resting at the border between Nepal and China. Unlike some of the other destinations, the Foundation has made little change to this one. No boats or bases for anyone to materialize into safety have been designated to the area. Instead, there's just an 8-meter hole where the bodies of D-class test subjects have been disposed of, hidden from view by a canopy. Only in extreme cases would the O5 Council ever want to evacuate here. Should SCP-120 display a yellow glow, then someone traveling through it will arrive in the Sahara Desert in Africa. The Sahara is being famous for being the largest hot desert in the entire world, only beaten in size by the northern Arctic and Antarctic deserts. Located here is a much smaller foundation installation, an outpost that would most likely be ineffective for housing anomalous objects but in an evacuation could prove to be a useful hiding place for important SCP documents, or even for members of the Overwatch Command. If SCP-120 produces a brown glow in its liquid, it will transport a subject to the Gobi Desert, a region in northern China and southern Mongolia famous for its unique ecosystem. Here, much like the Sahara location, the Foundation has established an identical small outpost. However, this one comes with the threat of another anomaly. SCP-4024. This is a saltwater spring that is gradually expanding across the Gobi, which, much like the teleporting paddling pool, has the ability to displace people and objects to an unknown location. Finally, should SCP-120 ever emit a subdued gray-colored glow, traveling through it will lead to an area in the Sea of Rains. But that's not a sea on Earth. That's on the moon. And it's not so much a sea as it is a vast plain. Luckily, if you were to end up here, the Foundation has already thought ahead and set up a station on the lunar surface, and it's thought to be one of their safest. So at least if the teleporting paddling pool sent you to the moon, you would be able to survive. That's reassuring. Of course, the real problem is, how do you get back home? That's a question for another day. Just like we told you at the start of the video, sometimes it's better just to face your problems head on because certain escapes can lead to more complications than you bargained for. Now go check out Minecraft World Destroyer SCP-4335 A Welt in the Crucible and SCP-5094 Miss J's WizKid Schoolhouse for more SCPs that put the strange into your childhood joys.